until this very day, or until recently, uh, we got used to a world which is run by states, run by people, run by nations. Sometimes they cooperate, sometimes they fight each other, sometimes they fight each other tremendously, as we saw some 70 years ago. Sometimes they exterminate each other, but always the considerations are worldly considerations. The nation, the leader, the fear, the state, the borders, the area, interests, you name it. Everything of those are worldly considerations. What we face today is a new equation. When Allah becomes part of the equation. This is something from a different level. This is a player from a different world. This is an equation with a variable which we are not used to. And all the theories which were written about struggles, about states, international relations, tensions, nothing can contain such a new equation with such a new player which was introduced into the world politics in the name of Allah. I might sound a little bit from different uh, world. Don't forget that I'm from the Middle East. And there, we don't have the Atlantic to maybe protect our shores from what happens there. But let, later we'll try to answer the question, is the Atlantic wide enough to keep this country away from the problems of the new equation? However, the new equation, I didn't, uh, I was, I, I'm not the first who discovered it. 15 years ago, after what happened here, like half a mile, mile from here, September 11, the then head of the Mossad, Ephraim Alevi, said that we are, or declared, that we are in a third world war. Of course, this world war is quite different from the world wars which we witnessed during the 20th century. It has different characteristics. The span, the geographic span, the players are different. Here we are talking about, here we are talking about civilians who kill the civilians. Usually wars, soldiers are killing soldiers. Armies fight against armies. Here, the fighter is a civilian and his casualties and his his targets are civilians. Not any more divisions, not any more tanks, or not any more um, warships, or all, all these things. Now the war is being done in a totally different arena. The streets, the stadiums, nightclubs, workplace, works, workplace viol uh, violence, you know. All these places which, since when are they a battlefield? But yes, this is one of the characteristics of the new world war. So first of all, it's different with the players. Now we have Allah, one of the participants in this war. Secondly, the war already, we saw it all the way from San Bernardino, all the way in the west to the Sydney, Australia, in the east. Remember the Lind uh, restaurant? And in between, Orlando, Boston, uh, Fort Hood, Paris, Paris, 
Paris. Germany, 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 like on, two weeks ago, four terrorist attacks only in Germany in every 48 hours. Some people beheaded, and in Normandy, a bishop beheaded. Okay? So, what we see is not only the players are different, and Allah comes to be part of the equation, even the methods of war, which the world was familiar with, are totally different. I, I'm not sure that that was even one case in the Second World War where somebody was beheaded deliberately in front of a camera as kind of uh, warfare. And that war definitely was vicious, inventions of gas chambers, things which only Satan can think about, but beheading in front of a camera, this is something which I think even during the Second World War, we did, we did. okay, we, we saw uh, um, in the First World War, the chemical war, okay, also vicious thing, but beheading? So, uh, this war actually is totally different from what we witnessed, and the longevity of the time, it can, take who knows how, how long. And then the worst thing is that at least one of the sides is very, you know, you, you, you don't know who he is. It's not an army which has a uniform and basis and state and borders. He is everywhere. He is, he could be any man in the street. Women also. He could be in your workplace. He could be your uh, subordinate, as happened in France, that one employee beheaded his, his boss. It could be your classmate, as was in Germany. It, it could be anyone. So the, anyone becomes a suspect in this kind of war. How can you identify your enemy? If anyone, and I'm as far as could be from, from saying that everyone is a terrorist, but who is, who is the terrorist? You know, in Israel we tried to once portray the, the character of a terrorist, to find what can characterize a terrorist. And every model which we tried to portray was uh, destroyed by another action which was a perpetrator was somebody who didn't fit the description. So we, finally we came to, um, uh, uh, the, the bottom line is, a terrorist is somebody above the age of 12. <laughs> this is what we can say. It could be a male, could be a female, could be educated, could, could be ignorant, could be sick, could be healthy, could be wealthy, could be poor, could be, Learned, could be whatever you like. So we did not have yet terrorist attacks uh, perpetrated by children less than 12 years old. So, so far, this is the description which all the, all the occurrences can fit. Okay, so what? Every Muslim above the age of 12, 12 is a terrorist? Not at all. So how can you describe a terrorist? before he becomes a terrorist. This is the problem. So the enemy actually is unknown. And this is something which makes this war into something totally different compared to what we were familiar with until it started. So this new equation is actually what is in the Middle East because in the Middle East, if you, you hear many times about, let's say, terrorist attacks in Baghdad. Baghdad, a terrorist, is a man in the street. But since everybody there goes with a garment, men and women alike, so it's very easy to hide an explosive belt under your garment, even if you are a man. Of course, if you are a woman. Okay, so every man in the street can be a terrorist. So what are you going to... Try everyone, man or woman, to see if he's a, he has an explosive belt on himself. 
it, it doesn't work. Baghdad is a city of six million people. So you're gonna check six million people every day? This is impossible. This is why Baghdad is, is, is a city with so many victims. Because everyone can be the rest. Now, if, if they take a regular, not a tank, and not an armored, via, uh, armored uh, 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 carrier, they take a regular truck in order to run over people in Nice or in something else. So what, now we're gonna, we're gonna say that all the trucks became a weapon and you're gonna ban trucks from France or from any other country only because a, a, a truck can be used as a weapon. So even the weapons in this war are different weapons. From the knife, which you can buy in every store of um, um, harvest or, or, or even kitchen utensils. Okay, you can you go to kitchen, be, be armed from your own kitchen. And all the way to trucks. So what, now you stop selling trucks? Or the truck dissemination is, there are too many trucks in the streets? Okay, so what will be now? So here, all the characteristics of this war actually turns it into something which is totally different and things had to be formulated in order to fit it and about this I will uh, talk later. The question is uh, what, what created this war? What brought us to this situation? How the heck the world arrived in, into such a, a situation where we are in such a wide war, long time-wise, and weird when it comes to the participants, the players, the killers, and the methods and the, and the tools which they use. How did we come to this uh, situation? Uh, I'm afraid that I will have to speak until tomorrow, and tomorrow is Shabbat, as you remember, evening, if I go and try to trace the history of the Middle East which brought the world to this situation. But what I would like to is to concentrate on the last, let's say, 15 years, but I'm not talking about all 15 years, but on, with the snapshots, uh, but mainly about the last two or three years because the acceleration of this war, of this war, during the last two, three years, is tremendous. And I'm not ignoring what happened in September 11. But definitely when you see the sequence of events of the last two, three years, definitely we see here a, a, a curve which goes up in all the statistics. I would like to start with the establishment of Al-Qaeda uh, during, during the 90s as an organization which was designed to, to continue the big success which the jihadists had in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. As, as, you, as you remember, during the 80s, the Afghanis were fighting against the Soviet Union, and thanks to help which they received from inter alia, this country as well, uh, they succeeded to chase out the Soviets which brought about the demise of the Soviet Union and the creation of those 10 states on the ruins of the Soviet Union. Those jihadists who were local Afghanis and foreign volunteers, especially from Saudi Arabia, uh, and Saudi Arabia actually sent to Afghanistan those days many people who were convicted and set long periods in the jail, in the Saudi jail. At some moment, when the West, including here, wanted to support the Afghanis against the Soviet uh, uh, invasion of Afghanistan, somebody has this brilliant idea to ask the Saudis to, uh, to send their prisoners to Afghanistan to be jihadists with one way ticket. Means you get your freedom either to kill or to get killed and you don't get back to Saudi Arabia. Many took this opportunity and some superpower took all those to Afghanistan, to Pakistan, and they went to Afghanistan to fight against those uh, uh, Soviets there. So 
uh, definitely it was a good, uh, good war, and they succeeded. And the volunteers who came from Saudi Arabia and Yemen as well, and some other countries as well, with more or less the same arrangements, uh, uh, definitely succeeded. And after they succeeded to topple the Soviets, and what happened with the Soviets later, that the Soviet Union actually was divided, they felt that they are almost almighty. Why? Because the almighty is with them. Who else gave them the victory, if not the almighty himself, who operated the West in, in a way that the West supported us? Okay, so all the Western support actually came from, from heaven through the West. That's how they saw things. So definitely Allah is the one who gave them the victory. Okay, what are we doing now with all the power which we have and the know-how and the experience which we accumulated in the battlefield? Of course, we are going after the other infidels after we succeeded to chase out the Russian or the Soviet infidels. And who, are, who else are infidels? Europe, America, and others. What's the difference between the Soviets and those? No difference. Those are Christians. Those are Christians. So what's the difference? Okay? So it, the success which the West gave them actually acted against the West. Who thought about this? Who expected it? Who anticipated it? Who talked about this, this possibility that the snake which we actually gave or we uh, brought to the world in, 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 in Afghanistan will actually run after us after he got rid of the Soviets. But people in some countries in the world see their interests more or less until the edge of their nose. They don't learn what happens beyond the, beyond the, the nose or beyond the hill uh, when they deal with other cultures. They think that everyone wants to be like us and thinks like us. And since we gave him what we gave, he will be our friend. Okay? For this you need languages and you need to learn cultures, especially the cultures of the Middle East. So being so confident about their success, they continued. And then we had the, the coal, the destroyer coal uh, in the end of the, of the 80s, and the two em embassies of the United States in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and in Nairobi, Kenya, which caused the lives of almost 300 people in one day. And uh, what was the price which they, which they paid? Some tomahawks which were flown to Sudan in order to kill some cows or some people in, in uh, one of the camps of Al-Qaeda. Okay, this was the price which they paid for uh, what they did. Means they understood that the West is weak. Nobody, and there was all the intelligence, all the information which was needed was there about Al-Qaeda, about its uh, uh, bases, about its centers, about everything. And I know because I was in the intelligence, and I know, I know what was known. And states cooperated those days very well on these things. And uh, exchanged uh, knowledge and know-how and, of course, information. Um, and then, um, they, during the 90s, they moved everything which they had to Afghanistan, especially from Sudan, and they actually took the state under their auspice with the money. And bin Laden actually uh, took Afghanistan as some, some kind of a hub for his activities. He uh, established in, in uh, Afghanistan hundreds of facilities, bases, uh, training facilities, even prisons, madrasas, means uh, schools, libraries, mosques, whatever they wanted, they did in Afghanistan, as if it was their own country. Of course, they had the Mullah Umar who, who ran the country, but uh, Al-Qaeda was there. And uh, they uh, uh, prepared the big hit, which came at September 11, 2001. This apparently was too much 
for the stomach of the of, uh, United States of America. And as George W. Bush uh, said, we are on a crusade. Uh, of course, this uh, expression was interpreted uh, wrongly in the Middle East, as if we are again in a crusade, and we'll meet this term later. And uh, his advisors advised not to repeat this word particularly, because it immediately reminds the people in the Middle East about the crusade, crusades of the 10th century and 11th and 12th century. You know, uh, Richard uh, Lionheart and all those who occupied Palestine and other parts of the Middle East, and Jerusalem, of course. So uh, it immediately connected what happened, what happens today with what happened almost 1,000 years ago. So his advisors uh, told him not to repeat this word. You can talk about war. It's OK, but not about crusade. Good. So America went with its friends and allies in order to get rid of Al-Qaeda, really, in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan. And the success was very good, less than three weeks. And the whole country was occupied. All these bases, facilities were destroyed. Um, all the members of Al-Qaeda, especially the volunteers who came from other countries, which are much easier to identify, um, were either killed or taken to Guantanamo Bay or dispersed all over the world. Ran away. Those who ran away actually started a, a franchise of Al-Qaeda in, in many other places. Uh, Al-Qaeda uh, became an, an idea rather than organization because it was destroyed in Afghanistan. And the two leaders, uh, bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri, the Egyptian aide, um, hid in some cave. Sometimes they were in Waziristan, sometimes in other places, ran from place to place without any cell phones, so they could not be located. And they um, actually gave directives, very vague directives and general directives, to their followers who opened franchise of Al-Qaeda in many countries which they went to. Uh, so we, f we started to find Al-Qaeda in uh, Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, in Iraq, in uh, the Balkans, we saw their, their activity. We saw them in Libya. We saw them in, in uh, 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 Sinai. In Nigeria, they, with the Boko Haram, the local organization. So we, we, we saw them in, in many places being, uh, sometimes uh, uh, they were targeted by all kinds of drones. Sometimes they did not. Um, then, and I fast forward. The Arab Spring started. And I'm talking about December 2010. Started in Tunisia. And when Zain al Abdi Ben Ali, the president, ran away, uh, others became uh, jealous at the Tunisians who succeeded to topple their semi dictator. And it started in January 2011 in Egypt uh, and in Libya. And in Bahrain, March 2011, uh, in Syria. In Syria, it started in, as um, demonstrations of Bedouins in the southern town of Dara. And of course, in Syria, you're not allowed to demonstrate against the regime. You, you can demonstrate in favor of the regime, but not against. <laughs> you know, freedom of uh, demonstration. And uh, uh, since it's forbidden, the regime shot into, um, demon uh, into demonstrations. So everyone who got killed is a funeral. And a funeral becomes a demonstration. So the regime shoots into those demonstrations. And people get killed. And those who get killed are funerals the next day. And funerals become demonstrations. Okay. This is what happened in Syria since March of 2011. And the state deteriorates into this uh, 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 chain of uh, events which bred new events and new events and new events. And this is how this, this country 
deteriorated as of March 2011. However, they had a little problem. Soldiers who were ordered to shoot into demonstrations, in some cases refused. Why? Because they are their relatives in their hometown. What, they will shoot their cousins? And they know them personally. So the regime started to be afraid that this dealing, or this kind of dealing with the demonstrations might bring a, a rebellion in the army when the soldiers will refuse to obey orders to shoot at their cousins. So they talked with their friends, the Iranians. So the Iranians sent snipers on, they were on the roofs to shoot because the Iranians do not have any relatives. And, those, and anyway, Iranians uh, uh, hate Arabs since uh, the, the occupation of Iran in the seventh century. So um, they shot them. So some of the Syrians were courageous enough, went to the roofs and caught some of those Iranian snipers, put them in front of a camera, and forced them to speak and to tell in Persian what they did in Syria and what they were sent to do in Syria. So they did. They spoke, and they put it on YouTube. And the whole world saw how Iran is sending snipers to Syria to kill Syrians. So Iran got very you know, scared about the whole world will see this. So they pulled out all the, all the snipers, and they told their friends in Iraq, which they control already, and in Hezbollah, in Lebanon, to send snipers, because if they will be caught, at least they speak Arabic. <laughs> and some of them were caught, and they were put in front of a camera to speak in Arabic about what they were sent to do in Syria. Little Iranians know that the Iraqi dialect is very far from the Syrian one. <laughs> and once they opened the mouths, everybody understood that they are Iraqi. And who forces Iraq to send snipers? Iran. OK, so this is, it didn't, it, it didn't work. With the Hezbollah, the, the Lebanese, a dialect is closer to the Syrian, but yet it is different. And every Arab who hears Lebanese knows that this one is Lebanese and not Syrian. So it didn't work. And everybody knew that Iran slash Iraq slash Hezbollah are sending snipers in order to kill the Syrians. Go back to Iraq. In 2004, seven years earlier, the Al-Qaeda of Iraq started to function after the invasion of 2003, which toppled Saddam Hussein and dispersed his army. And Al-Qaeda was there in order to absorb all those Sunni soldiers who were very angry at uh, the Americans and their friends and allies who uh, destroyed the Sunni state of Iraq. And they joined Al-Qaeda, not because they were religious. Some of them joined Al-Qaeda with the bottles of vodka or, or whiskey. But uh, because Al-Qaeda can give a good fight, uh, like Izzat Ibrahim al-Duri, the deputy of uh, Saddam. And they joined with all the experience and all the knowledge about how to run a, 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 an army and how to fight. And they joined Al-Qaeda of Ard al-Rafidain, as called, means the, the land of the Euphrates and the Tigris, Eretz Hanaharai. And they started this ins insurgency against both the Americans, the British, and their friends and their allies, and against the Shia who received the power from the occupiers of Iraq of 2003. Um, the founder of Al-Qaeda in Iraq was a guy named Abu Mus'ab Zarqawi, who originally came from Jordan, Zarqa in Jordan. And he is famous in our uh, chronicles as the one who beheaded in front of a camera uh, the Jewish journalist, Daniel Pearl. 
So this is the man. And this is, this one, is one of the uh, famous actions of Al-Qaeda in order to disseminate its message by beheading Daniel Pearl in front of a camera. And this also went to the internet. Uh, he was killed after a couple of years, and somebody succeeded him, who was also killed, and another one succeeded him, who was also killed. And the number five of Al-Qaeda is a guy, is a guy named uh, uh, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. He had another name, never mind, but he named himself this name. When he was the commander of Al-Qaeda, he got in trouble with Al-Qaeda. Why? He told Ayman al-Zawairi, because Bin Laden, meanwhile, uh, the Americans got rid of. And um, uh, he told him, look, your jihad against the Americans, against us, is very good. Definitely. You succeeded to strike terror into their hearts. Very good. But what is the tachlis? What is the end game? What is your, what do you aim? What is your goal? What do you want to achieve? Only to kill Americans and others? This is something negative. We need something positive. What, what, what can be, what do you want? So they answered what they answered, but he was not satisfied. He said that we, the goal of the jihad which we wage against the West should be a state to resume the Islamic statehood which we had under the leadership of Muhammad, the prophet, peace be upon him. We have to renew the days of, the early days of Islam wherever we can. If we have a small space or small land, we'll do, do it small land. We'll hope to broaden it. Ibn Zawairi was against it. He said, if you become a, a sulta, means a shilton, a regime, people will hate you. As long as you fight against the West, people love you because everybody hates America. But if you become a regime which imposes law and order, taxes, and so forth, who will love you? Everybody will hate you. So don't do it. He, the Baghdadi says, no, I'm going to do it because this is the tachlis. This is what I should do. He left Al-Qaeda and established in Iraq an organization named ISI, Islamic State of Iraq. Because that's where he was. Because it was before the Arab Spring started. Then come the Arab Spring and the snipers and the clips on the internet, how the Iranians and the Iraqis and the Hezbollah, all Shia, are murdering Sunnah in, this, in the street. And he sees all these clips and he says, hey, wow, can, can I let this kind of war in Syria happen? Our Sunni brethren are being slaughtered, are being killed by snipers in, in, in Syria. How can we sit here and do nothing? And he starts to send his snipers to kill the Shia snipers on the roofs of Syria. And it starts to, be, be, to become a war of snipers at the beginning. Then, he, with the years, he accumulated more experience in other things. Explosives, bombs, cars, who blow up in the middle of wherever they want. So the, he has all this knowledge. So he started to send these as well. In August of 2012, they did something tremendous. They put some half a ton of explosives on the roof of a room where the leading uh, group of the, uh, of the Syrians were having meetings. Uh, it was Asaf Shaukat, the brother-in-law of Bashar Assad, and he's the chief of staff and the chief of the, of the police and the chief of the, of the Muhabarat, means the intelligence. And they were gathering there once a week in order to decide what to do. So what they did, this ISI, they put this half a ton of explosives on the roof, 
And like in mean, distance of like four or 500 meters, they took a camera, video camera, on a tripod. And they told the guys near the explosives, OK, we are ready. They started filming. And the other, guy, the other guys blew this charge. Of course, half a ton of explosives on the roof. The roof falls on the people inside. They get, they get all killed. Now, they put this clip on the YouTube as well to show. Now, and this time, already with their logo, the Islamic uh, organization of the, the ISI, and with uh, music or Islamic music behind it. And actually, they showed the other Muslims that the war in Syria now becomes a religious war. Why? Because not only Syrian rebels, Christians, Muslims, Druze, Alawis, and many others, it is Muslims in the name of Islam who are coming now from the Islamic State of Iraq in order to do what should be done to the Syrian regime. And they disseminate this again, all the uh, information about the Syrian regime, which is Alawis, who are not even Muslims, who are idol worshippers. And, um, and, 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 and this whole thing about uh, the Alawis who, who, who govern Syria as idol worshippers who deserve uh, death only because they are idol worshippers become part of the common knowledge in the Arab world. People didn't know it before. before it, it was an information which, okay, those who um, uh, know about uh, you know, uh, the secrets of the Middle East no, knew it. But uh, 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 it was something which was unknown uh, in the Middle East that Alawis are not Muslims. Until this very day, there are some people who do not know it. So, uh, and, and the war in Syria becomes more and more Islamic. And uh, of course, he invites all kinds of um, uh, volunteers from all over the world in order to take part in this. And at, this, at some point, he decides that his participation in Syria is so deep that now he, his name is not anymore the Islamic State of Iraq, but it is Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. And this is ISIS. This happened in March of 2014, two, 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 and a, two, two and a half years ago. And he starts to send, since now it's declared, start to send his troops uh, to Syria erases the borders. This is the part which was occupied by Islamic State in Iraq. This is the part in Syria. And he succeeded to spread his state on Syria, or his, uh, his ruling of Syria, this part within three weeks, in June 2014. And of course, these areas are scarcely populated because these are deserts. Uh, but their tactics was very interesting. They always came with a big number of pickup cars with machine guns uh, in the back, in the, in, on, on, on the uh, back side of the, of the, of the big pickup car, and with RPG rockets, and jihadists, and explosives, and assault on a village with whale, many less people in the village, or some strongholds of the armies, either the Iraqi army or the Syrian army. And everywhere when they went, they prevailed because they came with a big power on a small place. So this is, I would, I would maybe compare it to what Yishayahu talks about Nebuchadnezzar, Ke'esof beitzim azuvot kol ha'aretz ani asafti. As collecting abundant eggs, they collected the whole place over there. And that's how they did it. They didn't mess with big places like Baghdad, like Halab, because those places were too big for them. So they took uh, places which only uh, uh, small villages and strongholds. So this is why they, they succeeded to have a, a territory um, within three weeks, very rapidly. The main achievement was this city of Mosul. Mosul is, is a very important city in Iraq because Mosul is actually the economic capital of Iraq because of the oil industry, 
which is concentrated in Mosul. Mosul is a city of, together with the suburbs, is some four million people. Very big, very big city uh, with many factories. And everyone who knows something about urban warfare knows that such a city with four million people, uh, in order to occupy, we need something between two and four years because you fight actually from room to a room, from apartment to apartment, from house to house. Just like as Gaddafi said, we'll fight you dar dar, bet bet, zenga zenga. Means uh, apartment apartment, house house, uh, street after street. And this is actually how you fight, urban warfare. And the enemy is behind every door. It could be in the kitchen closet. It could be in the dining room closet. It could be in the, in, in the bedroom. It could be under the bed. It could be in the attic. It could be in, this, in the cellar. It could be everywhere. And you know, it's very, sometimes you fight with somebody. You don't know what to do, to, to slam him in the face or to shoot him because he's so close to you. This is urban warfare. So, uh, um, so sometimes you go forward, sometimes you retrieve, and the cost in lives for both the attacker and the defender are, is tremendous. And uh, this way it's very hard. Some of them would hide in the sewage, some of the, them, okay, everywhere they can, they can hide, and this way it's so uh, hard to occupy a place which is populated by people. This way it, it should have taken, um, something between two and four years in order to occupy a big city like, like uh, Mosul. However, they succeeded to occupy this city within one single day. The officers of the Iraqi army ran away in the morning. The soldiers found out towards the noon that the officers ran away, so they ran away in the, at noon. And the policemen, when they saw the army running away, they drew the conclusions and they ran away after them. So this whole city was occupied almost without any one shot. Now, why did they run away? They were very nicely trained by the Americans. They were uh, equipped by the Americans. And they were armed by the Americans. So why did they run away? The answer is twofold. The first one is what they knew already about this Islamic State. That wherever they go and they catch people who fight against them, especially Shia, like the Iraqi army and the police, they behead them. How did they know? They have cell phones. And they saw clips. Uh, Nusairi means Alawi. Officers and pilots, you can read it in the lower part, in the hands of the Khilafah. Nusairi means Syrian or Alawi. Um, pilots and officers in the hands of the Khilafah. Khilafah means a caliphate. Now, you can see those who are um, with, a, with a blue dress are those uh, Syrian officers and uh, pilots. Those who are uh, uh, dressed with a uniform, are the fighters of the Khilafah, means the Islamic State. Now, who identifies the uniform? American uniform of the Marines. They caught two giant bases of two divisions, Iraqi divisions, full of equipment which two divisions need, from tanks to kitchen utensils from cannons to ciphered communication devices. Everything except for the people they caught. And they used the Western churches. After they occupied, a few hundred years ago, Constantinople, which was the center of the Eastern churches, now they are after Rome, which is the center of the Western churches. OK? History, OK? History, with Allah's permission, will break the spine of the last crusade. Crusade? Aha. Remember? Crusade? Crusade. What's, what is the last crusade? George W. Bush? Not at all. 
The last crusade started in 1798, the invasion of Napoleon Bonaparte to Egypt, the occupation of Egypt. Why? Because in this occupation, the Christian forces occupied Islamic country, Egypt, and not only this, they started to bring all the Western ideas and devices like printing machine, which they brought to Egypt, which actually enabled later everyone who governed Egypt to disseminate the Western ideas, which actually destroyed the Islamic ideas because they competed with the Islamic ideas like government, like freedoms, like literature, especially what, when it comes to women. Because in Egypt, already in 1899, a book under the title Tahrir al-Mar'a, means liberation of women, was authored by an Egyptian author named Qasem Amin. Now, he didn't mean the women's sleep of today uh, in this country. What he meant, that women should be educated uh, so they can work in a decent profession because if a woman is a single mother because her, her, her husband died or divorced her, she should be able to provide for her children in a dignifying way rather than a way which is not honorable. Okay? In order to enable the women to, when they need, to work in a decent profession rather than in decent profession. Okay? So this is what he meant, all. But what do we mean? That women will start going to study with, with men and will work with men and will go out to the street and everybody will be able to see them means Westernism through the ideas which came by the books which were printed by the machines which the French brought after they invaded Egypt. Okay? So the West actually succeeded to invade the Islamic world through or since that invasion. Later came ideas like that women can go in the street without a hair veil, which started in Egypt in 1923 when Safiya Zarlul, the wife of the later Prime Minister Saad Zarlul, uh, started to walk in the streets without a hair veil. Look, a woman, a woman without a hair veil in Egypt in 1923 is just like a woman who wears nothing in the Fifth Avenue of 2016. The same thing. The same thing. So, who enabled this? The West, because of those days, the British already were governing uh, uh, Egypt. So the West actually introduced all these uh, uh, strange ideas, especially when it comes to women, into our societies in order to destroy our societies. Later came the newspapers, which disseminated ideas to where, wherever they came. Then radio stations in the 30s, 40s. Then came the TV in the 60s, 70s. Then came the color TV during the 80s. Then came the satellite TV, which came in the, 19, in the 1990s. And then the internet. And the worst thing is this, the cell phone. Why? Because this is a device not in order to speak to people. This is a device which gives autonomy and freedom to the 16-year-old girl to speak whenever she wants, about whatever she wants, with whoever she wants, and exchange pictures, whether she is dressed or not, okay, without the, the danger that somebody at home will pick up another extension of the phone and hear that, she, that this young lady is speaking with a boy. Because this granted her autonomy. And there is nothing more dangerous to the stability of the state of values and, a, 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 and the way of conduct in Islamic world than a freedom which is given to a 16-year-old girl. And who invented this? And who invented the internet? Or who invented the satellite TV and the TV and everything? The West, in order to destroy our 
culture. And this is the last crusade. So here they are in order to, to break all those who are conducting against us this last crusade. And that's what he says. Another rules of the game which should be changed is what people call freedom of expression or freedom of communication. F a, 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 a restrictions on the internet is something which we all reject. But I want to ask you, would anyone allow here a freedom of speech and freedom of communications for a pedophile? No. Why? Because it's against the law. Okay, this is, we, are, we agree. Would you allow freedom of communications for drug dealers? No. No. Okay, so we already agree that the freedom of communications is not absolute. There are things which every normal human being agrees that people who deal with some professions or some uh, uh, merchandise should not be given the freedom of speech and freedom of expression and freedom of the usage of the media. Okay? What, 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 what do I mean? Those who disseminate the ideology of th this thing should be defined no less than pe pedophilia or pe uh, the ideology of things of pedophiles and drug dealers. The danger, the danger which pedophiles and drug dealers posed on the, on the society is, I don't know if it's bigger or, or, or lower, but definitely uh, this is another danger. So if this can be defined as a danger to the society, why should be people who deal with this, why should they be given the freedom to use the communications? O means intelligence, surveillance, and uh, uh, getting into email, yes, just as being done to pedophiles and drug dealers. So the, the means which states which wants to survive uh, uh, should implement are means like do not let them come back and uh, uh, open your eyes and especially your ears to what they say and what they publish. I think that if I take step three, some concepts should be rethought in the Western culture. First of all, multiculturalism is something which allows mass immigration of people who you cannot vet, nobody can vet, and nobody can expect what will happen to them after a year or two or three when they get exposed to the societies which absorb them with all the permissiveness and the materialism which characterizes those societies. Because some people get very radicalized when they see what happens in the streets of the West. They could come as very peaceful people, but when they have to live this and to see what happens in the streets, some of them, not all of them, some of them get very radicalized against those societies. It happens in the second generation, definitely in Europe. And I think that uh, countries today should learn from the experience of Europe, because this is the most clever thing to do, to learn from experience of others, not your own experience. Um, multiculturalism should be rethought, and political correctness as well, because political correctness actually shuts the mouths of people like Ephraim Alevi 15 years ago and myself today, those who try to be a whistleblowers or those who ring the bell in order to wake up the people to see the reality, the war which is waged against, not against our states, against our civilization. Because this is exactly what they hate and this is exactly what they want to topple. And the sooner we get up, the sooner we wake up, the better it is for us. Thank you very much.
would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support JBS, the Jewish Broadcasting Service, with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double chai, or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the JBS homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please, indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM, to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.